This week on The Million Dollar Plan, you know what? It's a little bit of a potpourri of things. Two emails that uh, were follow-up from the last couple of weeks here on the show. So uh, I'll read those emails to you. Both really interesting. One from the UK. Lovely woman in the UK emailed us. Um, clearly, she does not listen to us on terrestrial radio. She's catching us on the inner Googles. Uh, and then our third segment is, we're going to call it uh, a new segment called Concept of the Week. Concept of the Week. You know, people say they understand compounding interest, and they understand how money uh, leaves their paycheck and goes into a 401k. They don't. <laughs> so um, I'm going to explain that to you. And we'll have graphics. So if uh, you're listening on the radio right now, you're going to have to catch it on PeteThePlanner.tv so you can see the graphics. If you're listening on the podcast right now, you're going to have to go to PeteThePlanner.tv so you can see the graphics. If you're watching on PeteThePlanner.tv right now, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the first email, uh, let, let's go from the lady in the UK emailed us. Oh, by the way, uh, went to Cleveland this week, met lots of lovely people up in the Cleveland area, uh, some companies we're working with. Let me tell you, there's no good way to get from Indianapolis, Indiana area to Cleveland, Ohio. Like I can, and I'm not kidding you. These, the, these words I'm using out of this mouth are, are the truths. I can get to Los Angeles, California faster than I can get to Cleveland, Ohio. It's true. It's like 308 miles away uh, to Cleveland. But y you have to either uh, drive, which I did, a uh, five-hour drive, or you have to fly to Chicago or Detroit to get to Cleveland. And with the layovers and everything else, I can fly to Los Angeles faster than I can get to Cleveland. Anyway, went to Cleveland. Uh, good times. Okay. This email is from a, a lovely lady named Juliet. What other name would you expect from someone emailing you from the UK? It's a beautiful name, Juliet. I find if you compliment a, a, a woman on her name, if you're a man, it, it definitely hinges on creepy. It's not like looking at a, a world leader and his wife and telling the world leader she's in really good shape. Beautiful. You know, here's the thing. So there's, we're going to get to the show here in a second, but this is my show, so we'll just we'll take my time. Uh, so many people are up in arms about so sort of what's happening on with the leadership in our country right now. I'm going to take uh, a cue from what President Trump does. So what, what happened this week, if you didn't see the video, he uh, met with uh, the, the French uh, President uh, Marcon and his wife, and when he was meeting Mrs. Marcon, he, he, he looked her up and down <laughs> like she was a, a prime ribeye, and he said, you're in great shape. And then he looked to Marcone, the president, and he's like, she's in great shape. Beautiful. So here's what I'm going to do. Every time I see a friend of mine, or even someone I don't know, and that person's with their wife, I'm going to do that now. I'm going to go, okay, let's move on with the show. Okay. Hey, Pete, having only been listening to your podcast for a few months, not... <laughs> I was going to get hate tweets about that, so I stopped. Uh, anyway, my husband and I are in our late 30s. We both seem to have different ideas on how we should be supporting our mothers and extended family. You see the blend from last week's show? Both our parents, only mothers alive on both sides, my condolences, worked most of their lives. Both have homes and they own uh, and have investment properties. So both uh, have a good home and money coming in each month. All right, so I'm sensing, sniffing stability right here. On my side, if my mom, she's from the UK, so she says mom, right? Like here we say mom or mom dukes, whatever. Uh, between me and my siblings, we are happy to help. Uh, but we work with her to plan ahead and try to make sure she is covered. My husband, a month ago, took out a loan to buy his mom a car, something we did not talk about. I'm still a bit shocked. It's left me wondering, how can we come to an understanding about how we help our families when we're coming from such different positions? Kind regards, Juliet. People from the UK, let's be honest, they're just more polite than you. They just are. Her name's Juliet. She says, kind regards. No one's ever wished me kind regards. All right, this is a complicated situation. Like th this, is, this is some marriage situation here. But here, here, here's how I look at it from a financial perspective. Like I said last week, I am not a marriage expert. I'm not a relationship expert. But when money is involved, I I've seen a thing or two. Right? I, I remember early when I was a financial advisor or, or late in my financial advising career, which I'm no longer a financial advisor, 
my office was a it was like a marriage counseling office. It, it legit was. We were known in the area I live of of solving hard money and marriage problems. People would cry and yell and use words that you can't use on the radio in my office. Not at me, but at each other. It was very uncomfortable. But I got used to how uncomfortable it is. So, Juliet, here's what I'm thinking. Number one, um, obviously, there needs to be a very blunt and uh, transparent conversation, not about how this makes you feel, but what are the rules? It goes back to what are the rules of your home? It's funny how the whole show blends together. About three weeks ago, we had a show on what are the rules, what are the standards in your home? Um, potentially, it sounds like you have separate finances uh, from your significant other. And if, and if that's the case, cool, that, that's, that's fine. Uh, I, I'll just say this. Um, my wife and I tend to, our, our finances are together. We have separate checking accounts, but it's all our money. Um, so it would be nearly, imp- I guess I could go out and, and buy my mom a car uh, tomorrow and, and my wife wouldn't have to know about it until I told her. And that would definitely would cause some issues. I think, I, I think what we really need to figure out is like, what's the, how, how, what are the rules for your money? Do you, is the most important thing in your lives, your own financial stability? Is it to um, take care of your family? I, I think part of this, when you, when you get in situations with buying extravagant things for parents, for some people that turns into repaying them and saying thank you for for raising you, right? I, I've seen that quite a bit. It's it's not too different than when a professional athlete gets drafted and they buy their mom a house or something like that. Uh, it, it's not too terribly different from that. So I'm with you, Juliet. That's a shocking thing to do uh, to to buy your mom a car. Uh, I, I just, I'm trying to say mom as, as much as I can, if you haven't picked up on this. I mean, mom's the word. Mom's the word. Uh, so this is what I would do. I, I would just say, uh, I would set the tone. You know, we, we have this blog post on PeteThePinner.com called How to Have the Perfect Money Conversation with Your Spouse. Also applies to significant other. If, if we're being honest here today, I've really come off the word spouse trying to be more inclusive of those that don't necessarily have a spouse, but maybe cohabitate or share finances. So I just say significant other. Is that PC? Yeah, it is. I don't really care. I'm okay with that. Uh, so go to uh, PeteThePlanner.com, how to have the perfect money conversation with your spouse. You know what? I'm going to pull it up right now because I want to uh, give you some tips. Uh, so I'm doing this live on, on the air, uh, which is always a good time. So let's just hope my Bing skills are good. So it's the first thing that comes up. Of course, I googled it. Here it is from May 2nd, 2013. The freshest advice only here on the Pete the Planner Million Dollar Plan. Okay, so the, the key is you want to take 30 minutes and set them aside with your significant other. And these are some of the questions. And you say, look, um, uh, can we talk about money for 30 minutes? And, and these are the questions. This is how the meeting goes. By the way, you probably need booze. You're going to need booze. Uh, question number one, and this is what Juliet, this is what you would ask uh, your, your husband. Is there something that I'm currently doing in relation to our financial life that stresses you out? See, what's going to happen here is you're going to let him unload uh, his financial concerns about you on you and then just stand by for what happens next. The next question would be, uh, what's my most annoying financial habit? Number three is, what am I good at when it comes to money? Hopefully, uh, he doesn't say spending it. Uh, Number four, uh, do you worry about money? honey. You you can add the honey because it rhymes. Number five, do you think we were in a better financial position 12 months ago than we are today? Number six, do you think we uh, are trending toward being in a better financial position 12 months from now? Number seven, if we could wave a magic wand uh, and eliminate one... Now I can't get UK and Harry Potter out of my head now that I just said magic wand. I've got problems. If we could wave a magic wand and eliminate one expense, what would it be? And do we need a magic wand to eliminate it? <laughs> Probably not. Number eight, do you mind if I answer the same questions as they relate to you? And that's where you just like slap down your cards and go, blah, ow. So, right, you just, you just took everything they had. You said, uh, I'm going to answer these seven questions. I want you to answer these seven questions about me and about our financial situation. I'm not going to argue with your answers. I'm not going to defend myself. If, if you want to ask me a question in relation to why I do something that way, I, I will take it. 
But then at the end of me answering all those questions, I'm going to ask permission to you to ask you the same questions you just answered about me. So I'll be honest, I've sent this to numerous people. This is what I used to do with couples who were in my office is I would just say, all right, uh, Billy, assuming the guy's name is Billy, shh, I'd, I'd touch his lips. Just, I'd shush him. Billy, we're going we're gonna to have uh, Tammy answer all these questions about you, and you just take it. And Billy sits there, and he takes it. And then I'm like, okay, Tammy, thanks for all your talking. Uh, Billy, we're gonna, now going to ask these questions of Tammy. And I'm telling you, it works. It works. All right, coming up after the break, another parent situation email that came up from the last couple of weeks here on the show. And then segment three, concept of the week, how compounding interest really works. That's what we're doing this week on The Million Dollar Plan. I'm Pete the Planner. Back on the Million Dollar Plan, a little potpourri edition of the show this week. Um, so during the break, Nicole and I were talking about the Trump thing again. Like the the idea that like you you go to a, up to a, a man and a woman who are married, and you look at the woman, and you say, "Oh, you're in really good shape," and then you look at her husband and you say, "She's in really good shape. Beautiful. I'm gonna do that all weekend long. I have uh, dinner plans." Um, you don't need to know my life, but I have dinner plans with uh, a CEO of, of a pretty big company next weekend. It was a nice invitation. I'm going with he and his wife, who I don't really know that well, and we're meeting them. My wife and I meet them. I am going to do that. I'm just gonna look her up and okay. Oh my god. Anyway, uh, email. So last week we talked about money and family, and I got a really good email and, and actually turned into my USA Today column this week, so I am scooping myself by sharing this with you first. I don't know. Hi, Pete. At ages 30 and 31, my wife and I have our financial house pretty well in order. The last thing hanging over head is the substantial parent plus loan balance my wife's parents have. They haven't prepared well for retirement at all. Both are in commission-based careers. And in the years following 2008, they fell on extremely hard times. They grew so desperate, they cashed out my father-in-law's retirement accounts to make ends meet, obviously at the worst possible time. Thankfully, in the short term, they are now doing better. But long term, I worry about their ability to retire. The Parent PLUS loans in their names are split into two consolidated loans. One was solely for my wife and had a balance of roughly $15,000 and an interest rate of 6.8%. The other has a balance of $75,000 at a 3.4% uh, rate, but is a combined balance between my wife's college expenses and her sister's. The share of the balance between the two is entirely unknown. Monthly payments are $300 and $500 respectively. We are currently paying the $300 a month on the smaller balance because we know it was for my wife's education, but the other $500 payment is being made by her parents. The sister is currently unable or unwilling to contribute. We currently have $2,500 a month in margin. We could use to clear out that smaller loan pretty quickly, uh, but we also have an older home and need some renovation that we'd like to save up and pay cash for. What do you think? That. A lot of moving pieces there, right? First of all, you know, I'm going to go back to something my dad said. And, and by the way, when people say, my dad always said, they're usually lying. <laughs> We've discussed this on the show, right? Grandma always told me, whatever comes out of their mouth next is not true. Because no one's grandma hits them on one particular point all the time. I don't think. But my dad always did say, in a question like this, you already know the na you already know the answer by the nature of the question. Like if you have to ask the question, that means you already know the answer. Does that make sense, Nicole? What I just said did that make sense? Do you know what I mean by that, or what Mike D means by that? No. Okay, like a question like this: this person is conflicted as to what they should do, right? And so what Mike D would say is, by the nature of them asking it, they already know the answer. They just don't want to accept that it's the answer. Does that make sense? Yes. Maybe I just said it poorly. Here's the answer. Well, of course, you got to... Here's what you got to do. 
they're doing the right thing by paying on the fifteen thousand bucks. They they are. Um, as I go on to say in the column, her parents uh, made a decision in two thousand and eight to not only liquidate their retirement accounts because of all this, but to take on the Parent PLUS loans. If you do the ages, they took on all this Parent PLUS debt, $90,000 are the current balances, in the worst part of their financial careers. In the recession, they weren't getting much commission because uh, they were on commission income. They, they were liquidating retirement accounts. So these decisions were made out of, I mean, this is where it gets a little weird. D- does a parent make a decision like that out of love, out of panic, out of obligation, like put yourself in those shoes. And we're, I know it seems like we're judging people and we're, we're just trying to, you know, draw conclusions, but this is how we learn on this show. We look at other people's lives. When you listen to the Tuesday episode of the podcast on a million dollar plan, we're, we're, you're learning about someone's lives. We're making judgments about them because we want you to learn some of you. So, so here's what I want you to do. Put yourself in this sh- these, these shoes. You're in your 50s, right? We're just going to say you're in your 50s. Um, it is the worst economy we've had in decades. Okay, so just put yourself here mentally. Your industry is dependent on a healthy economy, and things are not going well. Okay, you know, mentally. Your daughters are both in college. They cap out at the amount of student loan debt they can secure personally. And the only way they can go back to school, and by the way, the alternative would be they drop out of school with an unfinished degree and tons of student loan debt of their own, is for you to take out Parent PLUS loans, for you to borrow at least $90,000 at, at the worst time of your financial life. Like, Are you there mentally? Maybe you can't get there. I mean, if we're being honest, maybe you can't get there. Maybe you can't, uh, maybe because of the decisions you make and, and the stability that you experience, maybe you can't get to a place where it's the worst moment of your financial career and you're choosing to, to borrow $90,000 for your kids. I mean, clearly an act of love, but th- there's more going on here. And then, by the way, as as now these girls, these who were girls at the time in college, but they're they're young, they're women. As they look back at that time and they have perspective because they're adults now, what is their obligation? What is their role in in helping their parents become whole again financially? So my recommendation would be what you would think it would be: it was to uh, aggressively pay off the fifteen thousand dollars that they are already paying on, and, and the reason is this. It's got a 6.8% uh, interest rate. Yikes, that's brutal. Uh, so pay off that. You could do it in a few months, five months or something like that. I'm not good with numbers, six months maybe. Um, and then, you know, one of the, one of the operative lines in this uh, email was, uh, we can't figure out who's, uh, it's un- entirely unknown was the phrase, as to, is the, which is the sister's balance and which is the, the wife's balance, right? Well, we got to figure that out. You got to figure that out. And, and in my opinion, you do the best you can to then redirect your monies to, to that. Now, here's the, here's the problem. There's a much bigger problem here. They, the parents may have stabilized in the short term by the words of the emailer. But long term, it's an issue. Remember last week, we talked about this idea of throwing good money after bad, which is a, this offensive idea that... Even if you love your family and you have the means to help them, that if, if, and by the way, help is also subjective, that the money won't even matter because a situation can't be solved by the amount of money you can contribute. <clears throat> I, I do think this person should to make an effort to pay off their portion of the $75,000 loan. But more importantly, long term, her parents are in big trouble financially. If they liquidated their retirement accounts in their early 50s, is my guess, based on the age, <clears throat> that puts them in their late 50s now. I think uh, the guy who emailed me, he and his wife need to dig deep into the his in-laws' financial situation, as uncomfortable that is. Look, I mean, I don't know how you feel. Talking to your in-laws about money is, is a really uncomfortable thing, especially if you're a dude and you're talking to your wife's parents about money. 
Uh, but I, I would make sure that, that if you need to be there to assist them years from now, that you have the means to do it. That's what I would be worried about in this situation. I would be worried about, um, sure, they'll, they'll pay off their share, share of the 75000 The parents are already paying $500 a month towards that, and you'll help them get rid of that debt. But even if they clear out the $500 a month payment, let's say the $75,000 is paid off. Let's say I write them a check for $75,000 and send it to them, which I will not. Um, that $500 a month of cash flow in the big scheme of things, it's not going to save the day retirement wise. So that makes me a little bit nervous. This is one of those, those situations. You know what? And I, I talked to this woman this week. I was uh, at an event and I get some weird stories. And, and this one's not weird as much as it is sad. And it's something that you don't think about. Um, man, we're about to take a weird turn on this show. We st- we started the segment by sort of laughing about the president uh, uh, looking up and down at a, a person and, and, and their, their spouse. But now this is going to take a strange turn. So I spoke with this woman who was probably in her late 40s and probably makes $40,000 a year, $45,000 a year. And she's taking care of her sisters, her sisters, grandchildren, okay? Her sister was 46 when she died. She's taking uh, care of her sister's grandchildren. And um, it's a horrendous financial situation because her niece, who is her her, her deceased sister's daughter is is knee deep in the opioid crisis that we have in our country, and so here's this person on forty some thousand dollars taking care of their sister's grandchildren, the legal guardian, and trying to figure out the financial reality of that while working full time, trying to deal with daycare, trying to deal with family situations, and I and I think that's why I told you we're taking a weird turn on this show right now. You, know, you hear stuff about the opioid crisis, and you hear about families and lives being torn apart. And I know the last thing on any of our minds are the financial ramifications of that. I mean, I know when I read stories about the horrendous opioid crisis in our country, I don't think about the financial ramifications. But when you're in it, and, and you hear a story about what the financial realities are of a family trying to support everyone else in the family going through the opioid crisis, man, it was eye-opening. And, and the one... The one thing that hit me the most in talking to this woman about the situation is, and I always, I always hate saying this, there was no solution. There was, for her, no solution, right? Debts were going to collection. Um, she, she was about to have a bunch of judgments against her. But she, she, she was, I don't even call her a victim, but she kind of is a victim of the opioid crisis because she's trying to, to step in and help a family member. Man, this show took a weird turn. Nicole, I need... Is there any Kahlua out there? We can find some. All right. Was that a weird, tur- was that a weird turn? But it, it happened. It's reality. Was that a weird turn? It felt... I mean, I kind of saw it coming. I, I yeah. do spend about 40 hours a week with you, but... Oh, uh, no. Sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. All right. Uh, coming up after the break, the concept of the week, compounding interest. You're going to explain. Uh, understand it the way I want you to understand it, and I want you to watch it on PeteThePlanner.tv. That's all next. Uh, I'm Pete the Planner. This is Million Dollar Plan. Back on the Million Dollar Plan, I'm Pete the Planner. Uh, so weird show this week. We're all over the place. I can start doing my Jeff Sessions impersonation if you really want to take it to a weird place. I've had some of the finest biscuits of my life in the South. That's anyway. Um, I'm convinced that he can remember every biscuit he's ever had, but he can't remember who he met with in December. Once in 1973, I had a biscuit at Jenkins a Restaurant in Montgomery, Alabama. It's one of the best biscuits I've ever had. <laughs> okay. All right. So the concept of the week is, man, this is a good episode. Uh, concept of the week is compounding interest. Okay. So please watch this at PeteThePlanner.tv. It'll make so much more sense because we're going to do visuals here. Um, so... Russell Investments out of New York has always told us, and by always, I don't know what that means, but they did a study and said that, that generally you should save 12 to 15% of your gross income every year to secure a proper retirement. So what I wanted to do is to take the time 
to walk you through what that actually looks like. Okay, so go to PeteThePinner.tv and you can follow along and watch this. But let's say your paycheck is $800 a week as we, as we look full screen here. $800 a week, which is a $41,600 annual income. Now, if you're sitting here thinking, I don't make that, I make more or I make less, I don't care, translate it for yourself. But if you were to take uh, an approximate net pay of someone making $800 a week, their net pay, their take-home pay would be about $600. That's after taxes, okay? So let's look at what taking 12% would look like out of that. $800 gross pay, and you multiply that by 12%. Anytime you put money into a 401k or 403b that's not a Roth product, um, the money is going to come out pre-tax. So 12% of $800 is $96. That means before your paycheck is taxed, $96 comes off the top, which makes your new gross income, your new pre-tax income, $704. Okay, that's what it would look like to peel off 12% uh, every paycheck. So then your new net, your new take-home pay, because then tax is figured on a lower amount, is $528, or in other words, $72 different. Okay, so think about this for a second. By the mere nature of how uh, tax deferral uh, works, and not tax deferral, I should say, but tax deductions work, um, by putting away $96 out of this paycheck, you only feel $72 different of your take-home pay because uh, $24 of it was sort of hidden via uh, tax trick, if you will. So let, let's look a little deeper. Uh, $72 is the difference, and but if your employer has a match of 3%, you'd be putting away $96. It would feel like $72, but $120 would actually be going away uh, during that pay period. You put away the 96, your employer puts away an additional 24 for you, and you only feel a difference of $72. Okay, so that's that's the... That's the first part of understanding how money comes out of a paycheck is uh, when people say, well, I can't afford to take money out of my paycheck. You can, and it's actually a little different than you think. It, it's, not, it, it's not as hard. If you say, well, I want to save 10%, it, it nets down because of the tax you save by taking the money out pre-tax. So, well, let's look at this. Let's say over a 40-year career, a 40-year career you were to set aside 12% of your income, and your income was $41,600 a year, your entire career, okay? So this is where we make some ridiculous assertions. I'm saying to you right now that you will make $41,000 a year through your entire career and never get a raise. But if you're able to do that, and you were to just set the money aside, you would have $199,680 at the end of that 40-year period. Now, that does not growth that didn't, didn't do anything. You just put it in your mattress. Every week, you just you set it aside. You'd have 199680 So when people understand this and they see this, they say, well, that's not a lot of money. After 40 years of savings, set aside, setting aside 12% of my income, that's not a lot of savings. And that's where compounding interest and your understanding of compounding interest comes into play. You have to understand compounding interest. If you do not understand compounding interest, you're in big trouble because it does the heavy lifting for you. If you set aside, in this example, 12% of your pay, $96 a week, feels like $72 difference, but it's actually 120 because of the match. If you do that every week for 40 years, you would have less than $200,000 if compounding interest was not a thing. If you're just putting in your bank account, or if you were somehow able to do that out of your paycheck, there would be less than $200,000 after 40 years. But but you, if you understand how compounding interest works, you'll see why the number is much different. So let, let's, let's look at it this way. If you, on January 1st, set $100 into an investment, and that's all you're going to invest that year because you think $100 is enough, and it earns a 6% rate of return, at the end of that year, you would have $106. Do you know how that, that, you know how that works, right? $100 set aside, it gets 6% uh, rate of return. So you have 106, 106. Okay, the year two, beginning of year two, you have $106, and you're not going to invest anymore because 100 is enough, right? So uh, year two happens, and you get another 6% rate of return, but you're not calculating 6% of 100 because now you have 106. So at the end of year two, you have $112.36. All right? See, this is how compounding interest works. Uh, you get a return not only on your investment, but you get a return on the return on 
the previous year's investment, right? So it's a hundred dollars turns into 106, 106 turns into 112, and it starts to snowball. Think of it this way: uh, when you're making a snowman, and for my listeners who do not live uh, in a place where snow occurs, you grab a snowball. This is how you make a snowman. And you roll it around on the ground, and as you roll the snowball on the ground, it gathers snow. That's the way compounding interest works. The further and the longer you push the the snowball on the snow, the more snow it gathers. And in this case, the the more interest or, or the more return it gathers. So without compounding, after 40 years of making contributions, without compounding, if it didn't exist, if it wasn't a concept, if it wasn't reality, you'd have 199,000 bucks. And so if you if you if if you experience that you're like, "Well, this is stupid. Why would I do that?" But but compounding is real. If you got a 6% rate of return on your money on average over that entire time frame, instead of 199,000, you have 1, 35,575 dollars. I'm going to repeat this. By putting $96 a week away, which feels like 72 because of taxes, and your employer puts in 3%, which is 24, so a total of $120 a week every week for 40 years, it's a million thirty-five. And by the way, we're, we're doing this off of a $41,000, $41,600 income, which never goes up, hypothetically, right? A million dollars. This is the power of compounding. It only works when time is on your side. I think I've said it on the show before, but think about the youngest working adult you know. Maybe they're 19, maybe they're 18. I don't, I'm not going to start naming numbers. I always do that. Nicole, you ever notice that? I like, give an example. Maybe they're 18, maybe they're 26, maybe they're 24. And I just keep going until I hit all the numbers. Do you ever notice that? It's like you work with numbers or something. I don't know. It's you know, just please. weird. I go with all these. Anyway, so, <laughs> so, okay, so let's say the person's 21, and let's say you're 38. The, the $100 that that 21-year-old sets aside is so much more powerful than the next $100 that you save as a 38-year-old because of time. Compounding interest is when you take money, expose it to risk, the market, and time, and then it can gather snow as it rolls. That's compounding interest. That's why, like, if you got a 16-year-old kid and they put 1000 bucks away for their, their, for their summer job or whatever the heck they're doing, that's going to be hundred thousand dollars by the time that one thousand dollars turns into a hundred some thousand dollars uh, as they get older because you've exposed it to time. That's why when people are in their fifties and they just figure out, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to stop working someday. And I, I say that half jokingly because every day of my career, I run into people that it's like, you know, I never really thought about that. I'm going to stop working. What? And then they can't use compounding interest. I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm convinced, and this is a theory. I have nothing to back it up. Totally anecdotal. I'm convinced people don't save for retirement because it seems like such a, a monumental task that they can't imagine they can accomplish it, right? They think, well, if I put this money away, it's only going to be $200,000 40 years from now. They think that because they don't understand what compounding interest is and how it works. I think once you understand compounding interest, you want it to be part of what you got going on, right? You want 100 to be 106, and the next year you want that 106 to be 112, and you didn't do boo except put the $100 away two years ago, right? That's the concept of the week. I mean, uh, short of my Jeff Sessions impersonation at the beginning of that segment, that was a pretty good segment. But I'll tell you what, I have a really good Jeff Sessions. Uh, for those that care, I think August 25th, I'm, I'm looking now, I'm doing a comedy show in Indianapolis, uh, a charity comedy show. I do them every five years or so. Uh, Friday, August 25th, location to be determined. It's going to be at one of the crackers in Indianapolis, Indiana. Six minutes of stand-up with your, with your boy Pete the Punter. No one cares. All right. Uh, coming up after the break, biggest waste of money of the week and uh, whatever else we have time for. I'm Pete the Planner. This is a Million Dollar Plan. All right, back on the Million Dollar Plan with Pete the Planner. We ran out of time. All my great impersonations, we ran out of time. Understand compounding interest, please. Please do. It makes a huge difference. And you don't even have to illustrate like 8% or anything. Just use 
Now, when I figure out people's million dollar day, I use 8% if it's a long term uh, rate of return, if we're doing over time, but do 6%. Understand compounding interest. That's all we have time for on the show because I talked too much this week. Uh, see you uh, next week. I'm sending you good vibes because good vibes are all that's in the budget. I'm Pete the Planner, and this is Million Dollar Plan. This is where I came from. Planet Love Tron, where we drop love bombs, funk missiles, and live in soul shelters. No help to skelter. The heat don't swelter because everybody stays cool. Left many moons ago to bring the philosophies of my ancestors to another place, God. Picked the third rock, gave me to my earth family, and told me to create. And so I am. Pin in my hand, microphone on the stand. Over vinyl, I command and demand. Magnificence in an instance, I can make you dance, cry, or love. Fly as a dove, released from Everest. The fresh is fresh, and you can call me ET, word to John Tesh. Let me bless this harmonic presentation. It's amazing, so amazing. I'm the reason. Uh, salutations, I bring you love, trying greetings from a far away land. I am the soul controller. Put the remote down and let me take control. You're now a part of my zone, so enjoy yourself. Love Tron can restore your health. I bring you greetings, uh, salutations. How you doing? And is that how y'all say it? The tinkling of the keys is an homage to the little, little star. I sojourn over poetic descriptions of sound and travel to my other world. Out of this world, spaceship on my arm took me home, filled by the ink and the megabytes, and the hypertext transfer protocol, stronger than the Skynet and the Terminator. I push faders into warp speed, glide with